Hello, this classwork number two is also known as section 7.2.3. I would use this classwork in place of the notes and by and large I would probably go over an example with you in a class over um, two column proofs. That's what this will be about. The first one is not. It's actually a rehash of whatever else we've done. But after that we jump right into it. Kind of a warm-up problem, if you will, but there are some things I want you to pay attention to, um, which would normally involve proofs because it involves evidence of what's given and what's not. Okay, we are going to find the area and the perimeter of the trapezoid at right. So um, they give you some information and we're going to figure out the rest. First, I will start with the area, which should be the easier one because we already have all of the given information. The formula for the area of a trapezoid, as we have deduced, is one-half times the sum of your bases times the height. Now, we haven't really thought of it this way, and I haven't told you yet, but we have seen, um, I'll write it this way as well, just this part. We have seen this kind of thing exist in the midpoint formula, where you take one length, you add it to another length, and divide the number of lengths that you have. So in essence, if you want to think about it this way, you're actually taking the average of your two bases and then you multiply by the height. So really it's like if you take a rectangle that is the average of the, well, that's a square. But if you take the, a rectangle that's the average of these two lengths, so somewhere in between there and if this was aligned properly, somewhere in between there. So this area is the same as that area there, really is what they're saying. Not necessarily a proof of any of that. We've proved it another way, but just for good measure. Okay, going back, let's go and plug these formula, these um, values into the formula here. If my B1 is 13 and my B2 is 8, doesn't matter which one you choose is which, as long as you stay consistent, times 4, remember your height is the vertical line, or well, the line drawn perpendicularly to your bases. Um, 4 times 21 is 84, and half of 84 is 42 square units. Okay. Perimeter normally is pretty simple because all you do is add up the sides. There's no real formula to it. So it's 13 plus 5 plus 8, and then plus this fourth side. Now, the problem is most people will immediately go to this and say it's 5. But I have zero information here that says that this is drawn, is that this is an isosceles trapezoid. This is not a figure that's drawn to scale, and I don't have any information here to say that this is 5. These are not marks congruent like that. So no assumptions can be made. So here's what you have to do. First of all, I'll go and just draw a line here. First of all, this line, drawn perpendicularly, if I really did that correctly, just assume that it is, means that this distance is congruent to base 2. So this distance from altitude to altitude should be 8, which means this distance plus this distance should be 5 because 13 minus 8 is 5, so if this is 8 and the rest that makes up base 13 would be 5, then this distance plus this distance is 5. Um, again, I don't have any information about this guy here, but let me first let me erase this so you don't think it's a 5. Um, we can use Pythagorean theorem to figure out what this part is in this right triangle. And um, you would go 5 squared equals 5. 4 squared plus b squared, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so 25 equals 16 plus b squared. b squared equals 9, b equals 3. If you've done special right triangles before, that's what this is. Special right triangles, a 3, 4, 5. So this length is 3. This portion is 3. The blue portion is 8. And the green portion is whatever is the rest of, that makes up 13. So 3 plus 8 is 11, and 13 minus 11 is 2. So this length is 2. Now that hasn't yet helped me find this out, but I will find it out now by knowing the height in your trapezoid is consistent. This is always 4. 4, 4, 4, 4, and 4. 
So to figure out this, which I'll call C, C is now using Pythagorean theorem over here. 4 squared plus 2 squared equals C squared. So 16 plus 4 equals C squared, which is 20. So C equals the square root of 20, or 2 times the square root of 5, or some other decimal approximation. So that's 2 root 5 units. So your perimeter includes 2 root 5 as well. And again, I don't know what the actual decimal approximation is, so I won't try. So this is 18 plus 8, so this is 26 plus 2 root 5 units. And again, it's something else. Whatever, 5, five is 2 point something, okay? So, or, um, square root of 5 is 2 point something, so 2 times that is between 4 and 5. So it's about 30, 30 or 31. Um, and that's good. Okay, what I'm going to do here is introduce, well not introduce, but um, we've used them before, but now we're actually going to use them fully. Two column proofs. So there are six problems down here, A through F, and for each pair of triangles we are going to, de we are going to determine if they're congruent and, um, let's see, record any ideas, make your conclusion true. Okay, so we're going to do these things within our two column proof. So don't worry about what these say necessarily. And uh, I'll re-describe what two column proof is. But for me, it's the best one in that it makes you always list your reasons with your statements. You can always do that with a flowchart proof though. And the reason why I like a flowchart proof is that you can connect your ideas into one thing. So for instance, we haven't done this much, but if you do this to draw a conclusion, that's fine. But sometimes you do this to draw a conclusion here, and these two guys should draw a conclusion here. That's where flowchart proofs work really well. A two column proof lists every statement and reason singly, and you have to go one by one to figure things out, as long as you have a reason behind it. And given is a reason as long as something is given. So what I'm going to do is you have a template sheet and that's what you're going to use. And I copied these images over to that template sheet. So I'm about to jump into it. And uh, I didn't copy this part over. So I might write the letters in a different order that they do. So if you're going straight off your worksheet, make sure that you correspond proper parts as you write the final statement, which is your concluding statement of what's congruent, or if you don't know if something's congruent. So I'm jumping over to another page right now. Okay, so two column proofs, this was A, I'll just call it number A. Actually, let's see what the number was. 87. So these are all for number 87. So A, B, C, D, etc. Two column proofs let you list statements and the reason that associates with that statement. And I'm going to do this by number, that way I can correspond proper, well that should be a one, correspond proper um, things when they align, if you write out a line. Okay, I want to prove that two triangles are congruent, and I will use one of these properties here, or one of these um, congruence conjectures, one of the five that you know, and if I can't determine one of them, then I can't say that they're congruent. Okay, I always like to start with what's given. Either they will diagram it for you, or they will literally write it for you. They might say, for instance, they might even say AC bisects angle BAD, something like that. But in this case, they actually remark that these are given. So I'll start with uh, angle B and D because those are easy ones to write. Angle B is congruent to angle D. Why that is given. Okay, And then you go on to number two. You list another reason, a statement and reason. So the good thing about two column proofs is you can never outdo yourself in listing a statement without having a reason behind it. If you don't have a reason, you cannot list it. So I can't say that this angle is, well, I'm sorry, there will be a reason behind that one. But I can't say things otherwise. Don't know why that popped up. Okay, uh, angle BAC is congruent to angle DAC. Also given. I want to get a sl uh, slimmer pen here. I think I'm, I don't really like how large that is. Okay, um, I have two. How do I say this? 
you're trying to prove with one of these things. Right now, I have two angles, so I'm looking for angle side angle or angle angle side right now. I'm kind of going to say that. And just because I'm writing these as A's right here doesn't necessarily mean they correspond. In this case, they will actually. Um, but remember that the order matters. So if I found these to be congruent with this side conjecture, it wouldn't be angle angle side. It would be angle side angle. I'm just letting you know that just because I write those things doesn't mean this is the order that I write my congruence conjecture in. Anyway, the third one that I want to mark here, though, is AC being congruent to itself. This is the reflexive property. So segment AC is congruent to itself by the reflexive property. Okay, And now I have a side. And this goes angle, angle, side with angle, angle, side. And that is a congruence conjecture to say that these two triangles are congruent. So my fourth statement my, is, is my conclusion. Angle or triangle ABC is congruent to triangle um, ABC to ADC. So that's important the way that you order it because of angle, angle, side congruency conjecture. Okay? So I'll kind of speed up through the I mean, you know how to prove triangles congruent. I just wanted to make sure you have the two column proofs there. I want to speed up through that stuff and just make sure you can determine things or not. Um, all right, so a couple things here. Um, and you can decide how to list it the way that you want. Um, I'll start with these two markings, and then I'll talk about the other one. I have segment QP congruent to segment QR. And that's given. I could say angle S, angle QSR is a right angle that's given, but I want to just use that and talk about why these are congruent. So I can say, I can either say angle QSP is a right angle because a, an adjacent angle to a right angle is also a right angle, but I can say that, that they're congruent as well for that reason. So I'll say angle QSP is congruent to angle QSR because um, adjacent angle, let's see, how do I want to say it? An angle adjacent to a right angle is also a right angle. And as we know, all right angles are congruent. So an angle adjacent to a 90 degree angle is 90 degrees. So that's my reason. 90 degrees equals 90 degrees. You can call that reflexive if you'd like, I suppose. That's not really the meaning behind it. But um, And number three, if we can find one, I do have one here. QS is congruent to itself for the reflexive property. Okay. Now, a couple things you want to be advised about Two specifically. Number one, this is not side angle side. You go from one part, if I start from the side here, I have to start counting to immediate parts after that. I have no angle, so side blank, side angle. I can't go side blank blank. I can't skip an angle and a side and then call an angle. So I have angle side side, and as we know, this is not a congruency conjecture. But we do have a right angle. And we have one set of congruent legs and one and the hypotenuses are congruent. So this will be HL. And HL again means as long as you have the hypotenuse is congruent and a set of legs congruent, you can determine by Pythagorean theorem the other sets of legs are congruent, which means side, 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 angle, side, whatever way you want to put it. But I will know that they're congruent. And that's where HL limits us. We don't need that extra information. We have that. So the other thing I want you to be careful of is just because you have, say, this information doesn't mean it's HL. I don't know these hypotenuses are congruent, right? I need some other bit of information in a triangle like that. So just because there's a right angle doesn't mean it's automatically HL. You have to know why it is. You need a hypotenuse and a leg. That's the exact definition of HL. So again, I don't know what order they do the congruency conjecture in. I'm just writing the letters in some way. QSP is congruent to triangle QSR because of the HL congruency conjecture. OK. 
Okay, letter C. I have two givens, L and N, congruent angles. And that's all that they mark for you. But I can mark something else for myself here. I have two vertical angles, which are congruent, and I will sign them three letter names. Angle L, M, P is congruent to angle N, M, O, because vertical, you can either put vertical angles or put vertical angles are congruent. I will know either way. Just make sure you do one. Verts, they are vertical angles. Uh, can we get anything else? Can I say anything about these sides? No, nothing to give there. You can talk about these angles if you'd like, but that won't much help you. In fact, I should talk about why angle, angle, side, and angle, side, angle are really the same. If you think about it, do I have an angle, side, angle here? I do not, but I have angle, angle, side. So if I have angle, angle, side here, you know that these two angles are congruent for the very reason that that's the, like the third angle theorem or whatever you call it. These angles have to be congruent to itself. So angle, angle, side works with angle, side, angle because you can deduce that third angle anyway. So that's why both of them are true. You can't determine a third side congruent if you have two congruent sides, though. Anyway, as I was saying, this is all the information I have. So I can't get anything else out of this. I can't squeeze out another thing. So um, you, can, you can say here that the triangles are not congruent, if you'd like, or there's you know, not enough information. Not congruent to triangle N, M, O. And for good practice, you might as well keep them in proper order, this L to this M as this N to this M. Um, not enough info. Or you can say not congruent over here, whatever else, or you can just stop. Well, don't stop. Do, some were put not congruent. Okay, letter D. They give you nothing else but a midpoint. So there won't be a given here. You can, you can say, um, why is the midpoint of these things given? But you're going to use that as a reason, actually. If something is a midpoint of WT, that means it bisects these two guys. So these two guys are congruent because this is a midpoint. The midpoint divides these in half. And it actually divides these in half as well, X to Z. So I can mark those for myself. I'll say WY is congruent to YT because Y is midpoint of WT. You might want to write more. I just, I don't really have room. How did this get thicker again? I was wondering that. Okay, 2XY is congruent to YZ for the same reason, except Y is midpoint of XZ. And uh, again, vertical angles, we have these, the y's, I can draw those. I have angle w, y, z, or y, x, is congruent to angle uh, t, y, z, because um, vertical angles are congruent. Now, you, you'll notice this is a good practice that I do, uh, not just the three letter assignments, but I try and correspond still. When I say W, Y, X, I want to try and go from that congruent side to the angle to that congruent side as I do here. Because when I draw my, when I have enough information to state my triangles congruent, I can go ahead and recopy that one again. So I have enough information. I have side, angle, side, side, angle, side. So here I'll say triangle W, Y, X is congruent to triangle T, Y, Z. I corresponded it properly earlier on. That's why I'm saying I can do that. Um, that's side, angle, side. So it's easy to copy over instead of having to rewrite the letters later and confuse yourself. Okay, two more. E and F. Number E and number F. Whoops. Okay, we are. Um, you might want to write that these are given so that way you know what you have parallel and stuff, you can write those multiple statements or not, as long as you know what those things mean. But I'll go and write them for good practice. Maybe you'll use that as well. Segment DE is parallel to segment G, 
f it's given in fact I'm just gonna have this all as one statement and segment DG is parallel to segment EF sometimes if things are multiple givens and they're all sides whatever maybe I'll list them all as one and again you don't have to list that but at least now you'll have proof behind statements that you make for instance I can list alternate interior angles congruent here and here because I have a par I have parallel lines here which I or have given and I have a transversal here so that cuts these guys into alternate interior angles which are congruent so I'll go ahead and say and again I will correspond to these properly to help myself out when I do these triangles I'll say F G E is congruent to D E G the reflexive side is the last part as far as segments go so F G E is congruent to angle D E G because alternate interior angles are congruent and again I'm just going to list this as one statement again because they're all the same reasons angle D G E is congruent to angle um, where was I? DGE. So I'll go FEG for the same reason. Now remember, that's for these parallel lines. Only those are alternate interior angles for those lines. For the same reason, alternate interior angles are congruent. Okay, I have two sets of angles which are congruent. I need a side to determine congruency. And I can use reflexive property right here. GE is congruent to itself. by the reflexive property and I have a side which goes in between my angles so I have angle in this triangle in this triangle I have angle side angle angle side angle with angle side angle so notice how they correspond in fact I wrote them up here and I corresponded them I can write the triangle in either one of these two ways probably even more ways um, because I corresponded proper parts of this. So notice this one tick angle will match with this one tick angle. So if I write G first in this triangle, in this triangle I will write E first. Okay. I talked about this in the exam as far as like what you want to look for to determine congruent angles and such maybe a reflexive property in parallel lines because you're looking for alternate interior angles just make sure that you list them accordingly so G will go to E then to F for me as I do this so I'll go G E F and on this side I'll go E across here to G to D and the reason here is angle side angle okay one more this time you're actually given numbers. We haven't seen numbers in a while. Um, so this also one of the test questions here. If you have numbers that are congruent in two separate triangles, do they always correspond with one another? And that answer is no. Let's say that I have a triangle here. This is congruent. Triangle here and this is congruent. And I have 4 and 6. And here I have 4 and 6. Yes, these 4s are congruent and correspond with one another. These angles are congruent and correspond with one another. These 6s are congruent, but they do not correspond in the same sequence as, as they do in, uh, you know, in the different triangles. And you could say, well, yeah, but it's flipped over here, and that's, and that's okay. And that would be okay if I didn't know anything about these angles. I have side and this angle and no sign of this being 6. This must be 6 because that is 6, or the other way around. This must be 6 because that is 6. But I don't have any information for that. So I'm just making sure that you know it's not in every case that those always correspond. In this case, yeah, they do. Um, we have enough information here to start listing sides that are congruent. And you can always list sides being congruent, which is fine. You just have to make sure they correspond. So AB is congruent to ED. That is given, by and large. When you have numbers, that's given. 
and um, EF, I'll start with the first triangle first to be consistent. Um, BC is congruent to EF, also given. Now this one's a little strange here. I can say, um, I can say AF, this little portion right here, is congruent to CD, which is also given. But I haven't done side, 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 because I still have a small portion in between these guys that I haven't measured out. That's why it got thicker. I changed the color. So FC, we have to prove, because you can see AC is part of this triangle. DF is a part of this triangle. So I have to prove that AC is congruent to DF. Now, they have portions that are three here, and then they have this portion here that's together. Now, because it's together, and because it's one line, I can actually just say, and I'll keep using red, that it's congruent to itself, which is nice, because the reflexive property. Now, I don't know what that side length is. I don't know it at all. All I know is it's congruent to itself. And I do know, so if it was X, whatever it is, 3 plus x is equal to 3 plus x. It doesn't matter what x is, they're still equal. For all we know, it could be 0. I don't know. Anyway, so the side length AC in this first triangle is then congruent to DF. And I'm trying to give an actual geometrical reason that I can think of. Um, not that it's given, not that it's reflexive property, but the knowledge of the statements that we have before it I don't know, some summation theory? I'm not sure. The fact that I added these pieces together and these pieces together. I'll think of a reason, um, but you know what I mean right now when I say sum of, I don't know, values. I have no idea what to say for now. And again, that's not a, I mean, to me, it's a valid reason in that I'm convinced of what they mean. I just don't know what the actual term is. So I'll come up with something later. Anyway, triangle ABC is then congruent to triangle, so ABC is congruent to triangle DEF because of side, side, side congruency conjecture. So although I said these first few were given, I didn't yet know that they corresponded because I could have figured out different side lengths on the third side and then nothing really corresponds, in which case the triangles aren't congruent. Um, but once I found side, side, and side, then it's okay. There's, you, there are certain corresponding parts which match. Okay, so that's what two-column proofs are, statements and reasons. You list them. You, um, you have convinced everybody, including yourself, that these are congruent for these reasons. Okay, I do have one more that I want to do, and then hang it up. And I'll go and draw my own two-column proof here. You can use the back side of your own piece of paper that you have. Um, but I'll just go ahead and do it here. Get my statements and reasons going. <laughs> Excuse me. He's black. So first of all, we have to read the problem. And obviously I changed it. I didn't want to use, use a flowchart proof. I wanted you to use a two-column proof. I think this said, um, like, give reasons. Oh, no, it says put in your theorem toolkit. There's one that says give reasons in your flowchart proof. Here, we're going to give reasons anyway. Okay. Prove that if a pair of opposite sides of a quadrilateral are congruent and parallel, so they give us that if these are given, then the quadrilateral must be a parallelogram. So in order to do this, <coughs> excuse me, you need to... Give your, you need to get specific properties out of a parallelogram in order to make this work. So when you give your reasons, or, or your statements, I suppose, you're trying to give reasons with a parallelogram that you know to then say, A, B, C, D is a parallelogram because. So basically, they say, for example, because here's our property for parallelogram that I just need to know. I mean, there are many that you could use as long as one of them are true. I suppose the rest are true, always. Um, let me make sure of that. I guess so, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, if like if I just get opposite sides are congruent, then I'm good. But parallelogram, the easiest one I can always think of is opposite sides are parallel. Both sets of opposite sides. So we have one set of opposite sides. Now that doesn't always mean these are parallel because I could have even if those are um, well not even if those are congruent, these can be parallel, but I can make a you know a trapezoid. That's one set of opposite sides. Um, so, for example, they say for the quadrilateral A, B, C, D at right, given this information, we are going to show this part. And if we show that part, then we have determined that it's a parallelogram because both sets of opposite sides were parallel. Now, we can't just say it looks like it. We have to give actual reasons. So, let's start with the givens, and I'll make them in one statement. A, B is parallel to C, D, and A, B is congruent to C, D. That's given. I should use a different color because I'm going to start marking this up. Statement number two. Um, I'll just go ahead with what I know. I know that this this is congruent to itself. AC is congruent to itself. Reflexive property. If you ever find something that you know to be congruent, go ahead and draw it out, list it out down here. But don't draw it without listing it. You want to make sure that you're drawing a conclusion based on this. Okay, I have these sets of parallel sides and this line transversal. That makes alternate interior angles congruent. So it goes through there. My alternate interior angles are here and here. If you can see that, I'm going to erase them. So look at that for a second. Okay, going to erase. So alternate interior angles are congruent. So that is angle BAC being congruent to angle DCA because alternate interior angles are congruent. Okay, so I can now prove I have um, side, angle, side with side, angle, side. So I can prove the triangle is congruent. Angle B, the triangle BAC is congruent to triangle DCA. Notice the order I write them in, the same as that, because I corresponded earlier, because of side angle side congruency conjecture. Now, my I wasn't here to prove these triangles were congruent, but I can use that triangle congruence, uh, the triangle congruency conjecture to then make other statements based on that. So if these triangles are congruent, then corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So this will be easy because I know which parts are congruent. I'll go and list them out. I have one, two, three with one, two, three. So parts correspond. So that means angles B and D are congruent. One with one. B and D must be congruent because of CPCTC. Right now I'm not going to list that. I'm only going to list what I need. Um, and angle this this part of angle C is congruent to this part of angle A because of CPCTC and these sides are congruent because of CPCTC okay now I've drawn out the entire triangle here the entire uh, parallelogram and these these two triangles and all the markings I use but what am I going to use because of um, I'm trying to find out these lines are parallel. Right now I'm just marking it, but I don't know this yet. I need these lines being parallel. So for lines to be parallel, think about the converse of what you know about two parallel lines being cut by a line transversal. If two parallel lines are cut by a line transversal, then alternate interior angles are congruent. Now, if alternate interior angles are congruent, then the two lines that are cut by a transversal, are they parallel? And if you remember that converse, the answer is yes. That is something which you can use and which you know. So I do have angle, triangle, or uh, angle, yes, angle DAC. DAC is congruent to BCA. That is not given, that is CPCTC. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. That's what I figured out after the fact. Okay? Sorry about that. So, number six. I can now make the statement BC, I will scroll back up in a second. BC is parallel to 
to AD because if alternate interior angles are congruent, then lines cut by transversal are parallel. Okay? If I have a pair of alternate interior angles with those lines in that transversal, then they're parallel. Oh, I'm sorry, these ones. Then these guys are parallel. So now I've marked that these guys are parallel. So that could be your conclusion, I suppose, but I want you to make sure that you started with, okay, well, what's a parallelogram? If they didn't give you this for example nonsense, I want you to at least know that you knew what you were looking for. So my final statement, number seven, is that quadrilateral A, B, C, D is a parallelogram. The reason is because what you know about a parallelogram and what you found out is that both bots, both sets of opposite sides are parallel. Okay? Seven steps, but this, ladies and gentlemen, is a proof. I have statements, I have reasons to support. I use those reasons to start flowcharting this. So if you started to flowchart this, you would have gotten to some conclusion um, of these triangles congruent. And then you would have stemmed off and then you would have said CPCTC. And then you would have used that to say, okay, well then these guys are parallel because of CPCTC and then because of that quadrilateral. So that's how your flowchart would have looked. As long as you have the reasons behind it, it would have looked nice. But this one fully tells you every single time statements and reasons. So that's the important thing. And uh, if you're not convinced at that point, when you do your own proof, then you might have done the proof wrong. Do not ever mark givens that are not given and always have a reason behind anything that's unmarked. And by the way, if something's given in words like this, if they give this in words and don't diagram it, you may diagram it. So AB can grow to CD. If they didn't mark it before, you can mark it on there. Only if they give it to you in number form or anything else. Okay, and that's it for the notes. Um, and uh, for your homework or whatever, you do your assignment. And there's this thing that I start and circled up top. This is a part of your homework. I want you to actually uh, take this into account. Reflect on the new proof format you learned today, two-column proof, compared to the flowchart proof you used earlier. What, to you, are the strengths and weaknesses of each style of proof? Which format is easier for you to use? Which is easier to read? Title this entry, two-column proofs, and include today's date. So this is a part of assignment number nine. So you have the assignment and what's, what's on it and such, and do this like on binder paper and whatever else. Um, so use this template though when you want to do two column proofs grab a couple sheets of those use the front and back Draw your own diagrams up there to help you that way you don't have to flip back and forth And it's easier for somebody else to see and list these as numbers to help you out as well and give yourself the concluding Sentence as well the one that you're trying to prove to be true Okay, and that is it